See, I do that because people at home are going, we can't hear him, and they're trying to turn the TV up, and it's great fun for me. Uh, picture if me, with me, if you will, uh, years and years ago, I, I had the opportunity to build an acreage. And uh, we got to take the trees down and do all of that. And my son, Levi, was uh, five years old at the time. And uh, he thought he was a man. Nothing doing, but when we went to work at the acreage and we went to build and to do, uh, my five-year-old son was convinced that he was the greatest helper in the world. And he would come with me. Uh, now, we would have five-gallon pails of tools and things that we moved around, and, and, I, and I can picture this and remember it in my mind, this little kid in his rubber boots out in this acreage setting, uh, and I'm unloading stuff out of my old rusty truck, and uh, he wanted to carry one of the pails and help me out. And uh, I knew the pail was too heavy for him, but I'm like, well, <laughs> go for it. Give it a try. And uh, you see him do the two-handed hop. And then you see him kind of drag. And you see the pail tip over. And you got to put stuff back in it and pick it up. And uh, after a bit, it's like, uh, Dad, it's, it's too heavy. And you smile and you go. And he knows that it's not too heavy for me. He just knew it was a lot for him. There's a spiritual parallel in our lives. And you, you can kind of laugh and identify with that story. But, you know, we were talking about prayer, and we're talking about this dad that says to us, hey, uh, whatever it is, bring it to me. Whatever it is that you're trying to pick up, that you're trying to drag, that you're bumping along, that seems to be more than you can handle today, or it's stealing your peace, sort of eating your lunch, is, I'm here. I'm here. I want you to bring it to me. And so I have a question as you come in today and you sit down and uh, we're going to get into a passage in James and he references Elijah and just because I love the story, we're going to talk about Elijah. Can I ask you this question? Just reflect for a minute. What are you carrying in today? Is there like something that you've been trying to move and trying to, to push and, and, and it's just immovable? It's too much for you by yourself? Has there been a load where you're bumping the bucket along? Are there things that just seem overwhelming in your life today? Or, or maybe I'll word it this way. What's dragging you down? I'll uh, use this as an example. Um, when something is dragging behind you, you don't notice right away, but after a while, that constant effort, that constant, right? And it's kind of like somebody where the trailer brakes come on, you're pulling a trailer, and it just, you're working harder and harder and harder. Does anybody feel like that? Can anybody relate? And we have this father that says, bring it to me. Bring it to me. Because we react in three different ways, right? And this is a gross generalization, so you might see yourself moving between a couple of them. One... I can do this. This is my job. We almost become martyrs, right? This is my bucket. This is where God has it. This is the country I'm in. This is what... And, and you just decide that you're going to grit your teeth and you're going to make it happen and you're going to do it. And you just keep trying even though you're not making progress and the burden is heavy and the load is overwhelming. There's maybe some of you that have gotten to the place that said, I don't think God knows what he's doing. I'm stopping right here. And I might need to give up. This is just too heavy. It's just too much. I can't do it by myself. But instead of turning and dragging it to the Father, putting it in His hands, you're just standing there waiting for something to change. Or how about the ones that just say, uh, I'm out. I need a different system I need to not care. I need to somehow to get this out of my orbit, my life, my bucket, and look elsewhere for meaning, happiness, or fulfillment. Today, I want to take you to James, Jesus' brother. 
He's a message that applies to all of us as we carry things in and go through this life. It's James chapter 5. He's wrapping it up. It's sort of a, he's coming to the end of this, this book that he's written. And it's a really familiar passage, but I don't want you to miss this. Let's read it together, starting in verse 13. Is anyone among you in trouble? Let them pray. Is anyone happy? Let them sing songs of praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let them call the elders of the church to pray over them and anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise them up. And if they have sinned, they'll be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Elijah was a human being even as we are. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain and it did not rain on the land for three and a half years. Again he prayed and the heavens gave rain and the earth produced crops. So, familiar passage? You, you, this is interactive. Even at home, you can put your hand up. It's okay. Uh, many of you have heard this before, and some of you are, well, oh, I hope he gets into this, and I hope he gets into that. So you're all going to be disappointed this morning. Uh, but let's start with this. James says this, is anyone? Now, now let's just go through this a little bit, because I, I want you all to know how included you are. Is anyone in trouble? One of the other versions uses the word suffering. Um, and it seems to be part of the human condition and part of the broken world that that's us. And his instruction is really simple. He's like, let them pray. That, that you have a father that says, hey, you don't have to do this alone. I, I, I'm right here. And, and he uses this imagery of a yoke where if, if it's too heavy on one side, someone else comes in and takes the load on the yoke. And Jesus says, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. If you've got trouble, if you're suffering, come. I'm here. Some of you are saying, well, life is pretty good. <laughs> I don't have much trouble or suffering. But don't miss this. If any of you are cheerful, happy, life is going good, it tells you to do something equally as important. Praise. Praise. What does that do? Well, it reminds you where that blessing comes from, the source of all things in your life. It helps you from making it an expectation, and thanksgiving is super important and super connected. So you got trouble, bring it to Jesus. you got praise, bring it to Jesus. Then he talks about something we all face at different times. Anybody sick? Facing some struggles, some illnesses, some challenges. You know, I, I don't want to spoil the ending for you, but none of us are walking out of here unless Jesus comes back. And it says, you know what you can do? You can call the elders, and there's two different kind of groups of people here. Let's talk about the first group, people that are older in the faith, people that have walked with Jesus a long time, people that know how to hear the voice of God and the will of God and pray with faith into your life. The other term for the elders would be those who have been given a role in the fellowship or the body. You know, James was talking to largely home churches. It would have been your home church leader or, you know, here we have a group of elders. But we would assume that there are people that walk closely with God and know how to listen to his will and would come and say to God, we're, we're asking you, Jesus, would you be manifest in this situation? Would you bring healing? And to pray and to anoint with oil a representation of the Holy Spirit. But it says, hey, when you face this, come to Jesus. Come to Jesus together. Because it's not the people doing it. You're coming to God. And it says the Lord will make the person well, right? It talks about anybody struggle with sin? And everybody's going to look away from me now. This is where I'm like, ooh, I should look somebody in the eye. I do. It talks about confessing your sin one to another. It talks about being forgiven. But it talks about healing. 
And let me just suggest this. As we pray, oh God, heal our nation, it starts with us. Are there things that God wants to do in our hearts? In healing. In bringing together. It says when you face all of this, bring it to dad. Bring it to dad in prayer and bring it to dad in prayer with others. And then James, the brother of Jesus, you got to listen to this guy, makes this amazing statement. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. And then he gives this example of Elijah. And he says this, Elijah was a human being even as we are. Sort of saying, you and Elijah have a lot in common. And I go, uh, I'm out. I know the story. I don't see it. Like Elijah was this prophet. Like, do you know what happened? And so as I work my way through this, I, I, I figure I'm not the only one that will have a hard time accepting this. So let's have a look at the life of Elijah. What do you say? Yeah? You in? It's a good story. We got a few minutes. So if you got your Bible or you want to look and flip over to it, it's in 1 Kings chapter 17. Uh, we'll bounce back to 16 and chase ahead to 19. But if you can find 1 Kings in there, uh, here we go. In 1 Kings 17, 1, we have just this little verse, and here's what it says. Now Elijah the Tishbite from Tishbe in Gilead said to Ahab, As the Lord God of Israel lives, whom I serve, there will be neither dew nor rain in the next few years except at my word. Now God has sent him to Ahab, and he says, uh, This is who I serve, so I'm coming on God's behalf. And that doesn't seem too scary until you back up a little bit and talk about King Ahab. We've got to understand the players in the context here, right? King Ahab is king of God's people, right? He, it says in 1 Kings 16, 29 to 33, that he ruled for 22 years in Judah, right? And so you go, oh, okay, he was a king over Judah, cool. You know, part of the people of God. And then you hear this. He was more evil than all kings before him. Like, you've got to really do something to become number one on the evil list of kings. Have you read through the book of Kings? Have you had a look into history at all? Let me read this for you. In the 38th year of King of Asa, king of Judah, Ahab, son of Ormai, began to reign over Israel, and Ahab son of Ormai, reigned over Israel in Samaria 22 years. And Ahab, the son of Ormai, did evil in the sight of the Lord more than all who were before him. And it, as if it had been a light thing for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nabat, he took for his wife Jezebel, the daughter of Ephbel, king of the Sidonians, and went and served Baal and worshipped him. He erected an altar for Baal at the house of Baal, which he built in Samaria, and Ahab made an Asherah. Ahab did more to provoke, provoke the Lord, the God of Israel, to anger than all the kings of Israel that were before him. This is a bad dude. And so as a prophet of God, uh, the first thing I say is I, I probably wouldn't really relish that assignment. To go to this evil king, more evil than the kings before him, who led the, worship, the nation to worship Baal and Asherah. You know, Baal was the god of success, right? And so he was the god of like crops and livestock. And, and, and so they didn't say that their god was providing and looking after them. The, for 22 years, he said to the people, this is who you're going to worship. And Asherah, the fertility goddess, sexuality, like they went sideways as a nation. And God taps Elijah on the shoulder and says, uh, you need to go talk to him. And so you think that Elijah with this grand thing comes to him. And look what happens next after he pronounces to the king that there's going to be no rain. Starting with verse 2 of chapter 17. Then the word of the Lord came to Elijah, leave here. 
Turn eastward and hide in the Kareth Ravine east of Jordan. Hold on. <laughs> he told him, poke the bear and run away. Kind of. Kind of. He was run and hide. And then he says, you will drink from the brook that I, and I have directed the ravens to supply you with food there. So he did what the Lord told him, went to the Kareth Ravine east of the Jordan and stayed there. The ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning and bread and meat in the evening and he drank from the brook. How many of you would have tried to cut a deal with God right there? Uh, could you spare a couple angels that can cook? I, I mean, I appreciate the brook thing, but the, those birds are dirty. And they're bringing me the only food I have to eat, and I'm alone, and I'm hiding. It gets better for Elijah from there, because uh, after a little bit, the brook dries up. <laughs> and he has to go back to God. And so as his circumstances sort of shift, he goes back to God, and he says, uh, what's the deal? The brook's dry. I don't have water anymore. And he says, I'll tell you what. I have this poor widow that has a son, and she'll look after you. I, you, you just go there. And so uh, he goes and finds a widow who has a son, and that means that she doesn't have really a source of income in that culture in that day, and that things are very tough, and the famine's been going on for a long time at this point. And he asks her, I'm the prophet of God, uh, how about some food and drink? <laughs> Here's her response in verse 12. As surely as the Lord your God lives, she replied, I don't have any bread, only a handful of flour in a jar and a little olive oil in a jug. I am gathering a few sticks to take home and make a meal for myself and my son that we may eat it and die. Yeah, like, uh, there's no hope here. The cupboard's empty. Why would God send him there? But he does. And the widow's faithful to give him that little pancake she was going to eat and die. And we have this miracle that happens where the, the flour and the oil never run out. Uh, great commentator said this, I hope she went into the cake business. <laughs> but we know that the flour and the oil were provided for her. And that every day there was something to eat for the prophet and the son and the widow. And that as you emptied the jar, it was refilled miraculously by God. So even though the brook dried up, he did find, a, you know, he's being sustained. And uh, you'd think that, okay, we've, we, you know, we'll just wait this out. God's looking after us. And, uh, oh, spoiler alert, her son dies gets sick and he dies. And she comes to Elijah and she says, is it because of my sin? What in the world's going on? I'm, I'm trying to do what's right. And now there's tragedy in my home. You know, for a widow, this is a, her only son and, and a means of support and retirement. And, but more than that, it's, it's her son. And Elijah takes the boy and he goes to, into a room. And he lays him on a, the bed and, and he stretches himself all over. But listen to what he prays to God here. He cried out to the Lord, Lord, my God, why have you brought this tragedy or tragedy even on this widow? I'm staying with by causing her son to die. And he stretched himself out on the boy three times and cried out to the Lord, Lord my God, let the boy's life return to him. The Lord heard Elijah's cry. And the boy's life returned to him and he lived. Elijah picked up the child and carried him down from the room to, into the house he gave him to his mother and said, Look, your son is alive. Then the woman said to Elijah, Now I know that you are a man of God and that the word of the Lord from your mouth is the truth. Three things about this snapshot that I don't want you to miss. The very first is that in the midst of that, I'm, in, I'm where God wants me to be and, and now this, 
Notice that his prayer was a question, not an accusation. He didn't say, God, you did this, you better fix it. He said, have you brought this tragedy even on this widow I'm staying with by causing her son to die? And what would you have me do? I think he went to hear what God wanted. He went to God to say, what in this situation can I trust you to do? What is the prayer of faith offered here? And then we see him stretching himself out and three times asking God to restore life, and God does. It says he heard Elijah's cry. He returned life to him. Notice it wasn't a one and done. That when he was convinced this is how God wanted to respond in the situation, this was the will of God that he waited on God. And then we have this confusing response of the widow. <laughs> now I believe. It's like, what? Haven't you been eating every day? You were ready to die, and now every day you have flour and oil, but it took this miracle for you to believe? And then uh, as I was preparing, it was like, oh, that's me. That's me. You see, when I don't praise God for what I do have, as James is talking about, and remember the source and where it comes from, it just becomes something I expect. My holidays or my vehicle or my heat in my house or my food. Or... And then when it goes sideways, I seem to need a miracle to believe. Hmm. Well, the story goes on. There's this amazing confrontation in chapter 18. Uh, the three years are up. He's got to go confront Ahab. And uh, you can read the story later. I'm trying to kind of just move on through and tell the story. And so he goes and he says, uh, I'll tell you what. There's 450 prophets of Baal, basically uh, I idol worship, these guys that uh, think they have all this power. Bring them up to the mountain, get two bulls. We'll make two different areas to sacrifice. We'll cut the bulls in half and uh, we'll all cry out to God. You cry out to your God, I'll cry out to my God. And whichever God shows up and burns up the sacrifice, uh, we'll agree that that's God and we'll follow him. And the people went, cool, this will be a great day. It sounds good. And they head up the mountain. So the prophets of Baal, they dance around and they do all their chants. And it says they get so worked up, they start cutting themselves. You can just picture this um, sort of demonic thing going on where there's blood and, and, and they're crying out and they're doing everything they can. And Elijah, this is where I really relate to him and I believe he's human like me. He mocks them. So, ah, maybe he went to the bathroom. Maybe he's asleep. Holler a little louder. And then uh, he takes his animals and he says, go get some water three times. They fill the trough with water, soak the wood, make this the most impossible thing that could ever happen. And this is what he prays in chapter 18. At the time of the sacrifice, so that would be the moment, and they rebuilt the altar where they would have sacrificed to God, right? Torn down to sacrifice to idols. It says this, The prophet Elijah stepped forward and prayed, Lord, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known today that you are God in Israel and that I am your servant and have done all these things at your command. Well, hold on, don't miss that. Don't miss that. He understood his position. He's not making himself the hero of the story here. God asked him to do it and he believed he would. And he's proclaiming it to people. Not me, it's him. Answer me, Lord. Answer me so these people will know that you are Lord. You are... Lord our God, and that you are turning their hearts back again. And I love that he's got this motivation, so these people will know. So great thing happened, a fire falls, it burns it up. He tells the king, hey, you know what? Head down and get ready. We're going to have rain soon, and, and you'll be able to eat. And uh, he retreats and takes his servant with him. 
And uh, after watching this miraculous display and all of this, here's how you see him respond. Not like, oh, okay, God's going to bring the rain. I'm going to get an umbrella and wait. He says to his servant, go look that way and watch for clouds. And in 1 Kings 18, 43 and 44, it says, go and look towards the sea, he told his servant. And he went up and looked. There's nothing there, he said. Seven times Elijah said, go back. The seventh time the servant reported a cloud as small as a man's hand is rising from the sea. So Elijah said, go and tell Ahab, hitch up your chariot and go down before the rain stops you. And the story goes on to tell us that the Spirit of God came on him and he outraced the chariot to the bottom of the mountain and rain fell. And uh, isn't that a great story? Don't you feel like, oh, seven times and he had the faith and, and, and just see the, he didn't leave like after the rain came. He, he saw the cloud and he knew God was doing it and off he went. And so we find Elijah, who's watched people raised from the dead, been fed by wild animals, seen fire fall from heaven, seen God answer everything, hit chapter 19. Now, we knew we had to get to Jezebel, right? She didn't see all of these things like the rain and the fire as something to embrace because it would take all of her power away. He killed 450 of her prophets. Yeah, Elijah was a little bit like me because he, <laughs> he, he killed those guys. <laughs> and she said, as surely as I live, today you will die. And you would think this man of God, this, this guy who had just experienced all these great things would go, uh, like you scare me. But he didn't. This is what it says in chapter 19, verses 3 and 4. Elijah was afraid and ran for his life. When he came to Beersheba in Judah, he left his servant there while he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness. Um, side note, that's a weird thing to leave your servant. Uh, it, it indicates to me that he wasn't planning to come back. He came to a broom brush and sat down under it and prayed that he might die. I've had enough, Lord. Take my life. I'm no better than my ancestors. Then he lay down under, a bu under the bush and fell asleep. And James chapter 5 tells us with certainty, we're like Elijah. Hmm. Maybe more than I imagined. Because Elijah wasn't the hero of the story. His God was. Elijah wasn't the one determining. He wasn't the one with the power. He was the one obedient that had knew the voice of God and had faith and trusted God. I mean, he's in the hall of faith and he simply persisted in prayer knowing what God wanted. Don't miss this. He wondered why. God, why is this kid dead? Why has this brook dried up? Why is this going on? He felt alone. He had to go and hide. He had to run away. He was often discouraged, and don't miss that God met him. Read the rest of the story, but it's not where we're going today. But often on the run and in hiding, he would persist in prayer. He believed God, and he obeyed God. I would say in James, when it talks about the prayer offered in faith, it's hearing from God, believing that he is able, believing that if he says it, he'll do it, and praying for his will to be done. So James says, our, our prayer is powerful and effective. And I go, yeah, okay. But he doesn't say our will. Now, don't miss this. Jesus says, ask anything. Come to me. Whatever it is you desire, ask, right? But don't miss this part of it. Give you three examples. King David. King David messes up. 
kills one of his soldiers, takes his wife, has an affair, gets her pregnant, tries to cover it up. Nathan comes to him, confronts him. He goes, you're right, I've sinned against God, apologizes. After he's restored to a right relationship with God, Nathan has said, your son will die. Do you know, for seven days, he tore his clothes, he fasted, he prayed, and he begged with God. Don't kill my son. And yet his son dies. And you see him get up and clean up and go to worship. You know, if it was just about what we wanted or we could just name it and claim it or proclaim things, you would say Paul uh, has a problem. Now, Paul, they say they used to try and get his handkerchief, right? Walk in his shadow. Like, people were getting healed. Miracles were happening in Ephesus and all over. This guy's been shipwrecked. Like, unbelievable things have happened to Paul. And yet, we know in 2 Corinthians 12, he says, I have a thorn in my flesh that God has allowed me to live with a disability with something wrong. And it wasn't that he didn't have enough faith to be healed. He just knew it wasn't in the will of God for healing to take place. And so he had absolute peace with it. Or Timothy in 1 Timothy 5. He writes Paul and he says, I've got problems with my stomach. And Paul, it's not like Timothy and Paul didn't have enough faith to ask for healing or... And yet he says, uh, you know, maybe you should try a little wine for your stomach. Uh, something medicinal. It was the medicine of the day in some ways. Or Jesus in the garden. Three times begging, I don't want to go to the cross. I don't want to face this. And yet coming into this alignment that says, not my will, yours be done. And then you see him getting up and going, time to go to the cross. Let's go. See, I think our prayers are powerful and they are effective. Especially when they're connecting us to the Almighty God where we're listening, where we're looking to what is your will? What would you have us do? What is your response in this situation? And then how do we align our will to your will? And it talks about the prayer of the righteous. Just a reminder, you guys, in Romans 5.1, go look this up. Some of you would say, well, I'm not righteous. The problem is, okay, maybe I have enough faith. Maybe I believe God can do it. I'm just not convinced he wants to do it. But the problem is God's not meeting me or answering my prayer or carrying my load or because I'm not righteous. And I just want to remind you, this side of the cross, all of your righteousness comes from Jesus and who he is. God sees you through the filter of the cross. You are not self-righteous. You haven't cleaned yourself up enough. You can never be so obedient as to be called righteous. You are righteous because of Jesus. It's imputed to you. And so all of a sudden you say the prayer of the righteous is powerful and effective as it's offered in faith, believing that this God can do this. And together, what does God want? And how do we persist in prayer and asking him? Let's ask the big question. So what? Talked about talking about what your need is this morning. What are you carrying in? Let's think back to that. Because the invitation from James is that we're to bring everything to our Father who kind of can carry that bucket no problem, right? And wants to put his hand on the handle with yours. Where is it that you're crying out to God? I love that we have this set-apart space where the Holy Spirit works and he meets us. And the invitation from James is to come, to pray, to lay it at the foot of the cross, to let him put his hand on the bucket and pick it up. The invitation is to give it to your Father. Don't miss that James' instruction includes our brothers and sisters in Christ and our posture, right? There's the confession of our sin. There's this thing that God will put his finger on your life, say, hey, you know what your issue is? There's some things going on here, hey, you've lost sight of. 
And he's so gentle to bring us back. And he says, if you confess your sin, he's faithful and just to forgive you your sin. Cleanse you from all unrighteousness. The invitation is to come. But have a confessing posture, Lord, if, 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 if it's me, right? An inviting posture. And then he says, invite others to journey alongside you. Those deeper in the faith, those who hear well from Jesus, those who are gifted to discern. What's God's will in this situation? Because we can believe he can do anything. I've seen him take tumors away. I've seen him heal people. And I've seen him say, no, that's not my plan. My plan is to take you home and restore you to full health and strength. I've seen him give answers that I'm not happy with, just like Elijah. And yet I've seen him do a work in my heart where I'm happy to be where he's placed me. And that I know his will is better than mine. And I come to this conviction that I can trust him. But it involves asking God together. You can't do this by yourself. Whatever it is, like Elijah wondering why God in the middle of all this, would this boy die? Be careful to posture yourself to ask the question, fully lament, fully say, God, I don't get it but to stay away from accusation. Because Satan uses that and quickly twists it to blame and quickly tries to tell you, you can't trust this God. Thirdly, over and over and over, I need to tell you, persist in prayer. Just because you prayed once and it didn't happen, don't give up. And persist in prayer that brings alignment. God, is this your, if you're convinced this is what God wants to do, if you said yes to him and you're obedient, but the situation you're in, the circumstances you're facing don't line up. I didn't envision it looking like this when I said yes to you, God. That doesn't mean he's not after it and he's not at work and you need to persist in prayer. And don't miss that this all involves a place of surrender where we come to the point of saying, not my will, your will be done. The promise in James, brother of Jesus, the authoritative scripture, is that God will act. He will join you. He will sustain you. He will not necessarily remove you from the situation. He's not a pinata that does your bidding but he's a dad who wants to put his hand on the bucket with yours. His burden is easy, his load is light. And prayer is the lifeline to that. Let me pray for you. Thank you, Father, for your word. It's true. Take away everything that's just Bob. But what you have for us, Holy Spirit, don't let us leave without you driving it into our hearts. Speak to us in a mighty way today. And now, Lord, as we stand and we proclaim truth about who you are and what you've done, receive of our praise. Would it be renewing, restoring in us, and would it be sweet to you? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.